Objection. This is incorrect, since the obstructions represented by particular forms, such as the lump or the two halves of a jar, are of a different nature. To be explicit, such obstructions to the manifestation of a jar as darkness or the wall we see do not occupy the same space as the jar, but the lump or the two halves of a jar do. So your statement that the jar, although present in the form of the lump or the two halves, is not perceived because it is hidden, is wrong, for the nature of the obstruction in this case is different. Reply. No. For we see that water mixed with milk occupies the same space as the milk which conceals it. Objection. But since the component parts of a jar, such as its two halves or pieces, are included in the effect, the jar, they should not prove obstructions at all. Reply. Not so. For being separated from the jar, they are so many different effects, and can therefore serve as obstructions. Objection. Then the effort should be directed solely to the removal of the obstructions. That is to say, if, as you say, the effect, the jar, for instance, is actually present in the state of the lump or the two halves, and it is not perceived because of an obstruction, then one who wants that effect, the jar, should try to remove the obstruction and not make the jar. But as a matter of fact, nobody does so. Therefore, your statement is wrong. Reply. No, for there is no hard and fast rule about it. It is not always the case that a jar or any other effect manifests itself only if one tries to remove the obstruction. For when a jar, for instance, is covered with darkness, etc., one tries to light a lamp. Objection. That, too, is just for destroying the darkness. This effort to light a lamp is also for removing the darkness, which done, the jar is automatically perceived. Nothing is added to the jar. Reply. No, for the jar is perceived as covered with light when the lamp is lighted. Not so before the lighting of the lamp. Hence, this was not simply for removing the darkness, but for covering the jar with light, for it is since perceived as covered with light. Sometimes the effect is directed to the removal of the obstruction, as when the wall, for instance, is pulled down. Therefore, it cannot be laid down as a rule that one who wants the manifestation of something must simply try to remove the obstruction. Besides, one should take such steps as will cause the manifestation for the efficacy of the established practice regarding it. We have already said that an effect which is patent in the cause serves as an obstruction to the manifestation of other effects. So if one tries only to destroy the previously manifested effect, such as the lump or the two halves, which stand between it and the jar, one may also have such effects as the pot sherds or tiny pieces. These too will conceal the jar and prevent its being perceived. So a fresh attempt will be needed. Hence, the necessary operation of the factors of an action has its utility for one who wants the manifestation of a jar or any other thing. Therefore, the effect exists even before its manifestation. From our divergent notions of the past and future, we also infer this. Our notions of a jar that was, and one that is yet to be, cannot, like the notion of the present jar, be entirely independent of objects. For one who desires to have a jar not yet made sets oneself to work for it. We do not see people strive for things which they know to be non-existent. Another reason for the pre-existence of the effect is the fact that the knowledge of God and the yogins concerning the past and future jar is infallible. Were the future jar non-existent, his and their perception of it would prove false. Nor is this perception a mere figure of speech. 
As to the reasons for inferring the existence of the jar, we have already stated them. Another reason for it is that the opposite view involves a self-contradiction. If on seeing a potter, for instance, at work on the production of a jar, one is certain in view of the evidence that the jar will come into existence, then it would be a contradiction in terms to say that the jar is non-existent at the very time with which it is said it will come into relation. For to say that the jar that will be is non-existent is the same thing as to say that it will not be. It would be like saying, this jar does not exist. If, however, you say that before its manifestation the jar is non-existent, meaning thereby that it does not exist exactly as the potter, for instance, exists while he is at work on its production, that is, as a ready-made jar, then there is no dispute between us. Objection. Why? Reply. Because the jar exists in its own future potential form. It should be borne in mind that the present existence of the lump or the two halves is not the same as that of the jar, nor is the future existence of the jar the same as theirs. Therefore, you do not contradict us when you say that the jar is non-existent before its manifestation, while the activity of the potter, for instance, is going on. You will be doing this if you deny to the jar its own future form as an effect, but you do not deny that. Nor do all things undergoing modification have an identical form of existence in the present or in the future. Moreover, of the four kinds of negation relating to, say, a jar, we observe that which is called mutual exclusion is other than the jar. The negation of a jar is a cloth or some other thing, not the jar itself. But the cloth, although it is the negation of a jar, is not a non-entity, but a positive entity. Similarly, the previous non-existence, the non-existence due to destruction, and absolute negation must also be other than the jar. For they are spoken of in terms of it, as in the case of the mutual exclusion relating to it. And these negations must also, like the cloth, for instance, be positive entities. Hence, the previous non-existence of a jar does not mean that it does not at all exist as an entity before it comes into being. If, however, you say that the previous non-existence of a jar means the jar itself, then to mention it as being of a jar instead of as the jar itself is an incongruity. If you use it merely as a fancy, as in the expression, the body of the stone roller, then the phrase, the previous non-existence of a jar, would only mean that it is the imaginary non-existence that is mentioned in terms of the jar and not the jar itself. If, on the other hand, you say that the negation of the jar is something other than it, we have already answered that point. Moreover, if the jar before its manifestation be an absolute non-entity, like the proverbial horns of a hare, it cannot be connected either with its cause or with existence, as the logicians hold, for connection requires two positive entities. Objection. It is all right with things that are inseparable. Reply. No, for we cannot conceive of an inseparable connection between an existent and a non-existent thing. Separable or inseparable connection is possible between two positive entities only, not between an entity and a non-entity, nor between two non-entities. Therefore, we conclude that the effect does exist before it is manifested. Namaste. So that was a long reading, but I didn't want to break that discussion because it encapsulates such an important point. What is the difference between existent and non-existent for any object? Well, it depends on your state of consciousness. If you're in, for example, Jagrat consciousness, then things exist when they are perceptible to the senses. And when they're not perceptible, as far as you're concerned, they don't exist. And this is the state of almost all 
people like philosophers and scientists and so on who speculate about these topics <clears throat> that they are looking for sensory perception to verify the existence of something. But Shankaracharya takes it deeper. He takes it into Svapna consciousness that something exists as a cause. And last time we went over the four types of causes. Even if it's not perceptible to the senses, in other words, is not yet manifest, the cause has not yet come into action, but it exists in a virtual sense, in an unmanifested state within the cause. <clears throat> and of course, the example is this universe. This universe, when it is unmanifest, still exists within Brahman, which is the ultimate cause. And when Brahman then creates space-time and enters into it as the Purusha, as Virat, <clears throat> then he goes about creating the manifestation. But that doesn't mean that the universe doesn't exist because it exists in his intention to create the universe. What is this called? Efficient cause. Remember, four types of cause, the material cause, the efficient cause, the formal cause, and the final cause. And you can go back and look at those definitions in the previous video to explain how the objects exist in the cause even before their manifestation. So, can we go deeper? Yes, we can go to Sushupti consciousness. And in Sushupti, nothing exists, apparently. But of course, it still exists in its causes. But then we go to Turiya, in Turiya consciousness, in pure, unconditioned Brahman, nothing exists except Brahman itself. And Brahman is aware of its own existence by consciousness of consciousness, awareness of awareness. This is Turiya. Now, we all have these four states of consciousness available to us all the time. So, let me suggest a meditation that when you first wake up in the morning, you observe your consciousness and try to pull it back from the bodily senses into the mind, which is dreams, and then back further into Sushupti, where you're conscious of nothing. You're still conscious, but there's no objects. And then, if you can, go all the way back into Turiya, where you're conscious only of being conscious. This is the best time, right after you wake up in the morning, before you even get out of bed, <laughs> to go deep into the states of consciousness. And in those different states, is the body existent? Is the world existent? Well, it depends. In Turiya, there's no body, no world. In Sushupti, there is a kind of world, but it's empty. There's no body. In Svapna, you have a dream world and a dream body. And of course, in Jagrat, everything exists. <laughs> so depending on how you look at it, you can say everything exists, or nothing exists, depending on the state of consciousness. Now, this discussion that we just read is about Jagrat consciousness. But Shankaracharya brings in the fact that the effect 
exists within the cause in a virtual form. So, for example, even though when we first encounter clay in the earth, it's in the form of a lump. Huh? Well, maybe after we dig it up out of the earth, it's a lump. But then when we shape it according to our intention, when the potter shapes it on his wheel like that, it becomes a pot. Now, when does the clay cease being a lump and start to become a pot? See, the clay is existent all the time. Even when the pot breaks and it goes back into the earth, it's still clay. That never changes. What only changes is the outward form. And there's a reason why Shankaracharya uses the example of a pot. Because, for example, let's consider space. Space is everywhere. And everything exists within it. So the question is, is the space inside the pot different from the space outside the pot? And of course, the answer is no. There's no difference. You can't tell the difference. You can't measure or perceive the difference. Space is space. It's the same everywhere. So even when the pot is broken, then does the space inside merge with the space outside? No, because it's always been just one space without any differentiation on the level of space. Remember, space is sushupti consciousness. Whether we call it a lump or a pot is on the level of svapna consciousness, dreams, thoughts. And the pot, or the, rather the clay itself, is on the level of jagrat consciousness. The clay always exists. So similarly, the universe, before it comes into manifestation, is an intention in the mind of God. So it exists, but it exists as an intent, as an efficient cause. And only after the universe is manifest does it exist as a material cause. So the very first act of the Purusha, when he comes into the universe, which is space with no objects, is that he acts by worshipping himself. And that fills the universe half full with his perspiration, water. And that water is born from his fire, his prana. Later on, uh, I think in the next couple of sutras, we'll discover that his energy is prana, his life energy. And that is a kind of fire. You know, why do we blow on a fire to make it blaze up? Huh? If you've ever gone camping and made a fire or in a wood stove, huh? you have to blow on it. So, this is air. This is prana. So, when we add prana to fire, it blazes up because of the increased oxygen availability and all that. But <laughs> the point is, through the prana of virat, water is created. This fire gives rise to water, and the foam of bubbles on the water then creates the earth. And so all the elements are created simply by the actions of Virat. And from those actions, then the rest of the universe is built following the laws of karma. And the Upanishad is going to explain all this in very elaborate detail 
in the next few mantras. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.